Hello there, how are you doing? Hope you are doing very well indeed. Another gorgeous sunny day here in Hong Kong and another day where I am stuck inside. Now you may remember in my last video I was talking about gadgets and I do have a weakness for them. I've been so paranoid about, oh no, will I possibly get ill, as I think most people probably are at the moment, I end up buying myself one of these temperature things, which I'm now obsessed with and basically checking my temperature every few days. Oh look, I'm okay, not ill. Um, bit insane, but there we go. Proof that I am gadget obsessed and that I often fall for crap tech. But I hope you enjoyed that video. And if you didn't, please do give it a watch. It was one of the longest videos I've done to date. Today, though, is going to be a fairly short one. I asked people if there were any topics they wanted me to cover. Uh, and one of my watchers, watchers, viewers, viewers, asked me if I do data protection laws all around the world. Now, you're thinking, is how can it be a short video if he's going to do data protection laws all around the world? Well, I'm not. Uh, that would be the law video equivalent of Ben-Hur or Gone with the Wind, except it would be incredibly boring and certainly wouldn't win any Oscars or indeed be nominated. So I'm not going to do that, not least partly because it will take too long, partly because I don't know the laws everywhere in the world and I have to do research on every single one, and partly because it would probably become out of date very, very quickly indeed. Instead, what I thought I would do is focus on data to protection basics. And this is really just the term terminology and how it works. And then maybe different approaches to how data protection works that do vary around the world. Now, lawyers, let's face it, we like jargon. Uh, lawyers can be absolutely terrible with jargon. Think about it. Until relatively recently, a lot of lawyers enjoyed doing putting as much Latin into their letters, into their court submissions as they possibly could, although sometimes it does still go on. Uh, if you go to certain universities, you study Roman law, which I can tell you is very, very interesting, but not particularly useful when it comes to modern day life, put it that way. Although I do know more than I should about Justinian, and you can Google that if you want to. But I thought I'd go through the very, very basics, the terminology and how data protection law actually works for those who... You know, we hear so much about it, and certainly on, on the back of GDPR or major data breaches, everyone knows what data protection should be or thinks they do, but when they hear phrases being bandied about, they don't know what they are. Now, I'm going to assume that you all know what data is. Uh, certainly the information coming through the pipes in this YouTube video, that is data. Certainly every bit of information you collect or have or have access to uh, is data. Even the music stored on all the records in this apartment, which I am inside still, is data. But what most data protection laws deal with, some of them focus purely on, on data itself, but often there's a focus on personal data. Not always, I have to stress, not always personal data, but often a focus on personal data. Now that is one thing that there is some contention as to what actually constitutes personal data. You can look at different data protection laws, you can look at different drafts of data protection laws, and they will take a different view on what constitutes personal data. Some will say it's data relating to an individual. And then you think, well, what does that mean? You dig deeper. Some will say it's data that allows you to identify an individual. If you look at the GDPR, there is a massive, massive definition of what constitutes personal data, including biometric data, data relating to what someone's beliefs are. It protects a whole new range of personal data. It makes the definition very, very broad indeed. But personal data, I choose the easy one at the moment, I would say it's something that allows you to identify a person. That is the general thrust, but it will vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction and different parts of data, different forms of data rather, will be seen as being something you can identify an individual with. Now it's relevant for lots of reasons. For example, is your face personal data? I would say yes, of course it is. It must be, surely. How could your face not be personal data? It's, you can easily identify someone. It would fit every definition, surely. Uh, but then what about facial recognition technology? What happens there? If someone's taking a scan of your face or a photo of your face and using it, they're collecting this personal data. Should they be governed by the relevant laws? Now, my view is yes. Some people would say no. Some people would say they are governed by it and that will allow them to collect data. But there we go. Now, I need to talk to you about three concepts. Personal data should be an easy one. But some concepts that get banded around are data subject, data controller and data processor. And I would say now, all of the laws use them. Some of them don't necessarily call them the same thing, but they all feature to a greater or lesser extent. But not necessarily do people understand what they are and what they do. There's usually confusion between what's a data controller and what's a data processor. Sometimes there's debates as to what they actually do and who they are. 
data subjects a bit easier. But anyway, I'm going to use some handy dandy diagrams to go to this. So uh, let's go to other Paul who's producing the diagrams. Over to you. OK, now we know what data is. We know generally what personal data is. It will vary depending on what data protection laws you're looking at. But what is a data subject? Let's go with a data subject first. And for the purpose of this diagram, I'm going to use BBC Television's Doctor Who. Uh, and here's one of the Doctor's uh, endpoints, if you can tell me who it is and which actor played him. Uh, although you don't win a prize, you just win gratification, I suppose. But data subject is the individual. In some cases, it might actually be the entity, if, if, if it's not a, a personal data focused approach, who, from whom you are collecting the data. So it's data relating to that person, that entity. It could be things like name, address, date of birth, could be DNA data, I suppose. It could be de details of, of, of who you fraternize with, if that's constituted personal data. It could be your religious beliefs. It could even be your political beliefs. All sorts of things can constitute personal data. So all of those things will be collected from a data subject. So when you're the data subject, you're the person who, hopefully knowingly, hopefully with consent, but who knows, providing data to someone else. Now, who is actually using the data? For whom, whose, whose purposes is the data collected? Now, for this purpose, I'm going to use, I'll stick with the Doctor Who reference. Here's Davros, one of the many enemies of Doctor Who. He is the data controller. Think of him as the mastermind, the person who wants this data, is using it for something. It could be to analyze sales details. It could be to create a new customer database. It could be to create some sort of payroll system. It could be to, to manage appraisals. Any, any reason at all, whoever is essentially using that data and normally collecting it, but not always, whoever's using that data will be the data controller. Now you can have more than one data controller, you can have joint data controllers, but I'm not going to go into the complexities of that. I'm just going to say for this purpose, you have a data controller. And there's one more piece of the puzzle. Now, it's unusual, at least it used to be unusual, but I think it's still quite unusual, for a data controller to do all of the processing and handling of data him or herself or itself. So in this case, obviously, I've got Davros here. I'm going to use the Daleks. Doctor's arch enemy and certainly created by Davros, the Daleks will be the data processor in this case. So what does the data processor do? Well, the clue's in the name. It processes, it manipulates, it deals with the data on the data controller's behalf. It essentially will argue, it often does argue, that it has no access to the data itself. Its view is just to process, send it back, uh, perhaps do some analysis, send that back to the data controller, but shouldn't really have any obligations directly towards the data subject, or should it? This is where things get a bit more complicated. Now, data protection law used to focus very, very heavily on the obligations of the data controller and the rights of the data subject. So if something went wrong, the data subject could go after the data controller. The data controller would normally be liable if, for example, there was a data breach and everything got stolen. That has changed. We're finding, certainly with the GDPR, which imposes obligations upon a data processor as well as a data controller, certainly with other data protection laws around the world, that they both have degrees of liability. Generally, this data processor doesn't have as, as severe uh, a potential liability as the data controller. Remember, some of the fines and penalties can be quite big, but they, they still exist. They still exist. So you're with me. Right, let's go back to me and I'll explain some of the issues. OK, keep that diagram in your head. You know, essentially the, the, the triangle of data protection, the three main things. Now, what you would find quite often, and you still do because I've had to be in negotiations about them, is that the data controller and the data processor try and hand off who's liable for the collection of data, who is responsible if something goes wrong, and heaven forbid that data gets stolen, who is to blame? And you can sit for argues arguing if, for example, there's a massive GDPR fine, can the data controller pass that on to the data processor? The processor will say, no, I'm only processing the data. I'm not responsible for anything else. Only if we do something absolutely terrible are we responsible. And our maximum liability is what you've paid us, because otherwise we'll go bankrupt. So it ends up in all sorts of back and forth and things which, for me, are very interesting, but they may not be for you. But there is still that, that battle going on. It's the... Um, so the data subject often will not know who the data processor is, but sometimes they, you know, they may, they may actually uh, 
talk about you know who the processor is who the data may be passed to for processing and the gdpr does require a lot more information to be given to a data subject when you are using a data processor now those are the basics those are the, the three obvious limbs the, the three main bodies who are involved in the collection and the use of data let's talk about various protections then that basic data protection laws put in place now these protections vary heavily from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Different jurisdictions allow you to do different things to a different extent. Some require consent for everything, some don't require consent, some leave it very vague as to what you can do without consent or what you can do with consent, which obviously for data protection lawyer is a bit of a nightmare. But a data protection law at its very basic, basic premise deals with a few things. It deals with how data is collected, how may data be collected by a data controller, uh, and maybe a data processor if that's going, but by a data controller from the data subjects. And it will set out what you can do, and it will set out the steps you have to take. Uh, a lot of them will be tell them that the data is being collected, get consent, uh, make sure that when you're collecting that data that's used for a lawful purpose. Uh, that's the first very basic tenet. The next one is it will govern how data is used. So it will say, okay, you've got all this data on someone, you can use it only for the purpose for which it was collected. So if you've told, for example, the data subject that you're going to use this data I know, to sell them ice cream, you can only use it to sell them ice cream. You can't sell them carpet because you're using the data for the same thing. Sounds ridiculous, but people do get into trouble for things as ridiculous as that. It tends to be more thing, more like financial products and insurance rather than ice cream and carpet, but you get my drift. So that's very important. And there'll be limits on for how long data can be used for, uh, whether a subject can actually make sure that the, 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 the data is accurate, those things, that comes into the next bit, really. Uh, the next thing, and the last of the big three, and again, I'm doing everything in threes, even though it's a lot more complicated than this, is how data is protected. Now, all of the data protection laws will have a greater or lesser extent of, of rules in terms of how you protect data. One will be allowing a data subject access to you think of data access requests, access to and the right to correct its data, which is, is becoming increasingly common and I think is, is, is a good thing. I once had an absolute nightmare with a credit agency who had my wrong date of birth. And so whenever I was applying for anything involving credit, so a credit card, even a mobile phone contract, I put in my date of birth and I get rejected straight away. And I was like, well, why is this? What am I doing wrong? Uh, eventually, I did a data access request from one of the credit agencies and found out that they had me slightly older than I actually was, but that was triggering a, maybe this is a fraudulent application. So this is very useful. But they will also deal with things like cybersecurity. What happens if that data is misused? How long can it be used for? When should it be deleted? Who can it be transferred to? And to what level can consent be enough? In some cases, even consent might not allow you to collect data. In some cases, you may need special consent. In some cases, you may be able to use the data without consent. You may have a legitimate use. So those, again, are the three main things. Now, these are basic, basic principles, very, very, very basic principles. I'm massively simplifying data protection law, but they apply to data protection laws around the world. I'm going to take a look. I, this is purely my view. I mean, most of my videos do say at the beginning, this is not legal advice. This is purely for educational and entertainment purposes, depending if you find this entertaining or educational or both. But I want to talk about, I see there's three main approaches to how a data protection law works around the world and the basics of them and really what they're trying to protect. Because I said at the very beginning, data protection law often protects personal data, but it's not always only personal data. And I think as we've seen the growth of the GDPR, and as we've seen the growth of the Chinese cybersecurity law, and as we've seen the US's approach to data protection, which has been very much state by state basis, there are very different approaches in terms of what they actually protect, whether it is personal data, whether it's state data, or whether they're looking more at financial data. So let's go to back to another diagram. I'm not gonna give you a map of the world, but I'll give you the three main approaches. So first off, here is the GDPR. For me, uh, although maybe I'm biased because I like European things such as baguettes uh, and Oktoberfest and is halloumi? Halloumi would count as well, I'm sure. And French films, actually. French films are often quite good. Anyway, I like European things, yeah, for, therefore I like the GDPR. The real reason I like the GDPR, though, is it's, it's basic foundation 
that everything it is built around is the protection of individual personal data. Anyone who is a European subject knows that their data will be covered by the GDPR and to, unless they do something really reckless, of course, and to a greater or lesser extent, they can assume their data will be collected fairly, used fairly, there'll be adequate protection in place. And if something goes wrong and that data is lost, then they will be notified and they will be able to basically take action to, to recover whatever they've lost or at least try to stem whatever damage there might be. So that's that's one. Now let's go completely in the other direction. So a law that came out at a similar time to the GDPR was the Chinese cybersecurity law. Now this isn't necessarily built around protection of individual data. This is built more on a concept that China has been running for quite a while and lots of other jurisdictions have now adopted too, which is that of data sovereignty. This is the view that you are able to control, much like you control your physical borders uh, and all of the, the your jurisdiction as to what comes in and comes out and you have sovereign power over it, you also have power over the data within your borders too. So for the Chinese cybersecurity law, there are elements of protecting personal data, but there's a massive focus on protecting the data of the state, of being able to use data to protect the state and making sure that any data that is collected is used, however it is used, does in some way benefit or at least not harm the state. And again, I'm not saying that any particular approach is better. I like the GDPR one, but that's just because I like European things, uh, like baguettes, as I said. But the Chinese one has some attraction too. And lots of jurisdictions are looking at that thinking, well, certainly that makes it easier for us to control the data flowing in and out of our respective jurisdictions. And you need to decide what should be allowed and what shouldn't. It's often easier to police as well. Now, what is interesting is that the GDPR has extraterritorial effect. That means that if you're collecting data from people in the EU, even though you're not in the EU, you can be hit by the GDPR. The Chinese cybersecurity law and most laws relating to data sovereignty do not. It doesn't really work. You're trying to enforce sovereignty outside, essentially quite a long way outside of your jurisdictional divisions, your lines, will be quite difficult under a data sovereignty focused law. Let's go to the last one. The last one is a bit more vague. And I'd like to call this sector focused data regulation. What a great name that is. It really does trip off the tongue, doesn't it? Now, this is where the data protection law doesn't necessarily come from an overarching law from the country. It may, I mean, in the, I used the example of the US earlier. Certainly, different states have different data protection uh, regulations and laws in state. But it doesn't necessarily come even from a government body. But the regulation and a lot of the regulation, certainly the most powerful regulation, is coming from industries. Now, a good example would be some US states, the financial sectors have imposed strict rules on what you can do with data. It makes sense. Data you collect, not just personal data, but financial data, what you collect, what you can do with it. And the penalties can be very, very severe. Now, I would argue and I've been critical of Hong Kong's uh, data protection law in the past, that Hong Kong should perhaps fall into this bracket. Because although, yes, admittedly, there is a data protection law and it does offer some protections, but it is in need of an update, which thankfully is on its way. It's much more difficult if you're in the financial sector with the HKMA, who are governing how you can collect and use data, to actually comply with data protection regulations than it is with the actual data protection law. So three very different, very, very different approaches. Now, different approaches carry with them different fines, different sanctions if something goes wrong, different standards you have to apply. Uh, GDPR, most of you probably know this, everyone's very scared about it. If you lose some personal data, the fines can be astronomical. Even if you lose some data, despite doing as much as you could, you essentially have to have state of the art technology protecting that data. Uh, the fines can be terrifying and the protection of the individual is sacrosanct. With a data sovereignty focused law, it changes a bit. There can still be heavy penalties for losing some personal data, but they often are nowhere near as bad as the penalties if you lose some state controlled data, some official secrets, something that is deemed to be beneficial to or harmful for the state if it is leaked or lost. So that is quite different. The penalties often, and this may be the nature of some of the states that, that go about data sovereignty, can be a lot more severe. Uh, you're often looking at, at custodial sentences on top of fines, which um, is one of those things, I suppose, is a deterrent, deterrent as much as everything else. But then when you go to a sector-focused approach, 
So again, fines tend to be the thing. If you're in the financial services sector and they impose heavy regulations on how you can use and collect data, then you can expect the fine to be huge. People just assume, I suppose, that people in the financial sector have more money to spend on fines and should be a bit more careful. But there we go. But again, they will vary. And often the fines, and this is true of Hong Kong, the fines and sanctions that you may suffer as a result of a breach of the regulatory rules about data end up being much worse than what is in, in effect the, uh, the legal position. So Hong Kong, another good example. The fines you may be levied by the, the HKMA, Hong Kong's financial authority, could be much much greater and much much more detrimental than any fine you would get under the personal data privacy ordinance at least at the moment and this means that we all need a different approach now i would be interested to know and i would please do com just put a comment on this video be it on linkedin be it on youtube wherever which approach you think is best because as i said earlier i don't what i do like the gdpr they all have their uses and they all have their places and the reason I find this so interesting, and why maybe maybe I'm just a massive nerd, but the reason I find this so compelling is that the original EU data protection law became the foundation for data protection laws all around the world. And there weren't really that many competing opportunities for other data protection laws to take the lead. But now, really, we have three. Uh, often, before, if you'd asked me maybe a few years ago, I'd say we maybe have two. But we have three. Do you want a data sovereignty approach? Do you want a GDPR personal data approach? Do you want to leave it to the business sectors to sort themselves out, which can be a bit like the Wild West, but will regulate those sectors very, very effectively? Or do you want a mis mismatch of all three? Do you want essentially putting together bits of the different law or allowing all three to apply at the same time? It's, it's a valid question. I don't have an answer. But I will tell you that if you are trying to operate in jurisdictions where there are all different data protection laws, it becomes a massive headache. Now, one of the questions that triggered this video was what are the data protection laws around the world? Um, frankly, they're changing all the time. Whenever you do any sort of data protection related topic, task, job, project, which let's face it, is most topics, tasks, projects, you need to be sure that you're complying with the local data protection laws, regulations, wherever you are operating, but you don't necessarily know where they are. Now, if you're operating in one jurisdiction, yeah, it's a pain, but you can normally figure it out relatively cost effectively. Speak to a lawyer if you have to. Uh, some cases you do more than others. Sometimes it's more complicated than it should be. Uh, do a bit of research and make sure what you're doing is in compliance with local law. Make sure that your data controller is doing what it should be doing, that you have a contract in place with your data processor, that if there's any problem, you're sorted. And the data subject has basically done everything that they need to do and you've collected everything from them to make sure you can process their data. Fine. But what if you were operating in four or five jurisdictions? If you're a startup, that's already quite a burden, a legal burden on making sure that you're compliant. What if you're a multinational who are operating in every country almost every country in the world. What do you do then? What do you do in those jurisdictions where the data protection law, you don't know what it is yet, then you find out what it is, but then you are told, and this happens, but the laws, the, the rules aren't really set in stone. So even though it says this, it might mean something else. It is a huge headache. As we find the three approaches being exported around the world, I think it's a headache that's just going to get better. Now, I would like to say that this dilemma for any organization is going to get a lot simpler, that we will end up with one great global data protection law. But we won't. Of course we won't. That's ridiculous. I mean, next we'll also get world peace and we'll all be living on the moon. Very unlikely to happen. In fact, if I was, uh, if I was approached by a young law student asking what, what area of law to get into at the moment, if, if they like things that can be sometimes a bit dry, perhaps, I would probably say become a data protection specialist because this isn't advice, by the way. Don't go and tell your kids. Paul says become a data protection specialist. They may hate you forever for this, but it's going to be an area that will not go away. If anything, it will get more and more complex across geopolitical lines, across different nations trying to basically curry influence with how they how they operate and the value of personal data. Actually, not just personal data. The value of data is becoming essentially this generation's version of the gold rush. Think how many companies, think of the top 20 companies in the world, think how many of them operate primarily 
on processing and using data. So yeah, something to think about. Um, I hope that's useful. I mean, I really just want to give you a data protection primer. If you have any questions, do speak to a data protection lawyer. It doesn't necessarily have to be me. I'm a tech lawyer, but it doesn't have to be me. And they can give you more details. If you have any questions as well, drop me a line and I'm happy to try and answer them as best I can. Uh, but I'm not going to start giving you the data protection rules in every single jurisdiction because uh, not only will that drive me crazy, it will probably send you to sleep. But yeah, hope you enjoyed that and I'll be back very, very soon.